Sunday afternoon, we was going to continue in Bible terminology, and the Lord decided to meet with us, and we never did get around to preaching from Bible terminology. But we had a wonderful service. I certainly appreciate that. Good time of fellowship, singing, testimonies, and crying, and prayer. Great blessing. Turn to Acts chapter 13, if you will. Acts chapter 13. Continuing with these Bible doctrines in our study, all of these tonight will be Bible doctrines. We'll do some definitions again next week, and then that will be all of them. But we're on Bible doctrine number 48, and that is justification. So we'll pray together, and the first place we'll look at is Romans 13. If you also want to find your place in, I mean, Acts chapter 13, if you also want to find your place in Romans chapter 3, we're going to be there as well. But we'll pray together before we get started. Father, thank you for this opportunity uh, to be back in the house of the Lord this evening. Thank you, Lord, for folks who have come out tonight to be with us uh, in the service. Thank you for the opportunity to stand, take a Bible, and to preach your word. I thank you for that. I pray you would help us this evening to say things that are pleasing to you, things that are helpful and needful. Uh, help us, Lord, to refrain from saying things that uh, would be contrary to your word and contrary to what you would have us to say Lord, we need your help. We do ask that you meet with us in a great way, and we'll thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Bible doctrine number 48, the doctrine of justification. The word justify in all of its English forms appears in the King James Bible 64 times in 60 verses. The word just means right. It means righteous, and it means lawful. So in the Bible, when we see the word justification, it refers to the action of making one right or making one just or righteous, I should say, and lawful. In the Bible, justification is a divine act where God declares a sinner to be sinless or just in his sight. Now, we understand and know that this is only possible through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. I have heard, and you have as well, preachers say, individuals say, when testifying or preaching concerning uh, the fact that they're justified, they'll make the statement such as, I have been justified. It's just as if I had never sinned. Well, there are some Bible verses that teach this truth, and let's look at these Bible passages, if you will. Come to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. <clears throat> We'll look at, probably should read several verses, but I will just read one. Look at verse 39, Acts 13, look at verse 39. And by him, and that him there is a reference to Jesus Christ. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And so by the Lord Jesus Christ, we are justified, not just from a few things or not just from some things, but the Bible is very clear that we're justified from all things and we could not be justified from any of those things by the law of Moses. Now, look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And verse number 24. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. The Bible says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So if we could not earn this justification, we could not purchase this justification, we could not buy this justification. It is freely given to all who will believe, place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now skip down to verse 28. That's verse 24. Look at verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. 
So the Apostle Paul, he is writing through the inspiration of the Spirit of God, and he says, I'm drawing the conclusion here. I'm concluding the fact. The conclusion is drawn. Justification is from all things. Uh, justification is, is uh, uh, we're justified by faith. We're not justified by the law. Justification cannot be obtained by keeping the law. Justification is acquired by faith. Now, let's look at one more. Come to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, actually a couple of more, I'm sorry. Look at Romans chapter 5, look at verse number 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So justification gives us peace with God. Look at verse number 9, verse number 9. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. And so justification is now. It's always present tense to those of us who are saved. What a blessing. And so we also learn from this verse that justification saves us from present and future wrath. We also see from this verse that justification is by faith in His blood. Not the blood of an animal, not my blood, not your blood, but it's by the blood of the spotless Lamb of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that justification, according to verse number 1, gives us peace with God. What a blessing. And so here's what we've seen thus far. Justification, we're justified from all things, not just some things. This justification could not be acquired by keeping the law of Moses. This justification is freely given to those of us who are anyone who will place their faith and their trust in the shed blood and the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They can be saved. Now, let's look at one more. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and look at verse number 30. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 30. The Bible says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. So because of our present justification, we are promised a future glorification, and that is provided us to us freely by the Lord Jesus Christ when we place our faith and our trust in Him. Now, come to Romans chapter 14 in one hand. We'll be there first. And then find Luke chapter 17. We're also going to get Ephesians as well if you are, can multitask. But um, Romans chapter 14, we'll look at Bible doctrine number 49. We will not go into great detail at all on these next two. They're on the list, so we'll hit them. But we have talked exclusively about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, so we will not say a lot about that. You say, preacher, why would you continue to mention them every time they come up? Because we learn by repetition, and it is good to be reminded. And so Bible doctrine number 49 is kingdom of God. The kingdom of the term, the term, the kingdom of God is found 69 times in 69 verses in the King James Bible. I want to say this, and, and this is important. I, you, you, this is a very complex subject, and we can, we can try to simplify it so that it's easier uh, to understand. But I will say this. This is a spiritual kingdom that becomes a part of you the moment that you get saved. I want to say that again. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom that becomes a part of you the moment that you get saved. Look what the Bible says in Romans 14. Romans 14, verse number 17. For the kingdom of God is not. So the Bible is going to tell us what it is not. Meat and drink. So the kingdom of God is not earthly. It's not fleshly, amen. It's not meat and drink. But, so, okay, contrast. But, this is what it is. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So all of those are spiritual. And so the kingdom of God is not earthly. It is not fleshly. It is a spiritual kingdom. All born-again Christians, I am right now, as a born-again Christian, if you are a born-again Christian, we are right now in the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is in me. Look what the Bible says in Luke chapter 17. 
I am in the kingdom of God because of salvation, and the kingdom of God is in me. So I don't know about that, preacher. Well, we'll just read it. Look at Luke 17, verse 21. The Bible says, Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, look at the phrase, behold, stop, pay attention, look, listen, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. All right, look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We are going through the book of Ephesians. And we have just recently went through Ephesians chapter 2. And so we will not stay there. I just want to show you this one verse. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 6. Well, let me... Let me start start verse number four. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Now, look what verse six says. And, so a continuation, and hath made us and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So right now, we are, we are in the spiritual kingdom of God, and the spiritual kingdom of God is in us. Now, I'll, let me read you one more verse, and then we'll look at the kingdom of heaven. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 says this, And hath raised us up together, and made us, I'm sorry, I'm reading Ephesians again, Colossians 1 13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So we've been translated from darkness, and we have been, we've been delivered from the power of darkness. We've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. That is the kingdom of God. All right, now, the kingdom of heaven. Bible doctrine number 50, the kingdom of heaven. Come to John chapter 4, John chapter 4, and Genesis chapter 1. John chapter 4 and Genesis chapter 1. Many people assume that the kingdom of heaven is the same as the kingdom of God. But just as God and heaven are not the same, you would agree with that, wouldn't you? The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are not the same. Now, God is spiritual. Look at the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 4 and verse 24. God is spiritual. Jesus said in John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so God is spiritual while heaven is a physical place. Look what the Bible says in Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So heaven is a physical place, not spiritual. Now, we've already established the fact that the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, and the kingdom of heaven is a literal, physical kingdom. You're in Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse number 28. Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse number 28. God gave Adam dominion over the whole earth. Obviously, it's a physical kingdom. Look at verse 28. And God blessed them, speaking of Adam and Eve, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Now look what he says. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And so the Old Testament continues. As the Old Testament continues, God appoints different men over this physical kingdom along the way. There is uh, Noah, Abraham, David, Solomon, etc., etc. Now come back to, or, or come. Now this is tough right here. Let's see. The, come to uh, Luke chapter 21. I'll say this. The kingdom of heaven departed in Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 28 through 30, when God judged the descendants of Coniah as far as him and his descendants sitting on the throne of David. And the decision ushered in what is known to you and I as the times of the Gentiles. The Bible says that in Luke chapter 21 and verse number 24. 
and then to find Matthew 3. But look at Luke chapter 21, verse 24. Let me show you this. The times of the Gentiles. Luke chapter 21, verse 24. The Bible says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles. Now look what it says. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, then came the kingdoms of the Medes and the Perds, per, Persians and then the Greeks and the Romans. So the, new, the, Jew, the, the Jews knew that God had promised them a kingdom. There are numerous Bible references uh, that prove that fact. I'm, I'm not going to read all these. I'll, I'll, I'll say them quickly. Uh, Genesis 49, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 49, Psalm 2, Jeremiah 23, Luke chapter 1. Uh, etc. There's even more than that where, where we understand that God promised the Jews a physical kingdom. In fact, look at, look at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. When John the Baptist and Jesus Christ walked on this earth, they preached that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Meaning, meaning it has not happened yet, but it's about to happen. Look what he said, Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, look what he said, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, look at Matthew chapter 4. Jesus, Matthew chapter 4, look at verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But listen, the Jews rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, and because of that, and they not only did they reject him, they chose a Gentile king. Come to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Jesus is fixing to be crucified. Look what the Bible says in John chapter 19. I'll read verse number 14. The Bible says, and as it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he said unto the Jews, Pilate's talking to the Jews, this is what he said to the Jews, Behold your king. He's talking about Jesus. But look what they said. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, Now look. We have no king but Caesar. They didn't want King Jesus. They wanted a Gentile king. And so the kingdom of heaven was not restored. It was at hand, but it was not restored to Israel. It was postponed. Now come to Acts chapter 1. After the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the disciples asked Jesus this question. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6. I'll read verse number 5. I think it should. It says, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem who? Jews, devout men, out of every nation. Never mind, in the wrong chapter. Hold on. Acts chapter 1. I was reading Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 1, verse number 6. The Bible says, uh, in verse number 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And so they asked the disciples. They asked the Lord. They're, they're, obviously, they're talking about a literal, physical kingdom and the kingdom of heaven. We know that. We know that because of the way they asked the question. They said, well, they, they said, will we not restore again the kingdom uh, at this time, the kingdom of Israel. So the Jews never had the kingdom of God. They only had the kingdom of heaven. And so for them to ask for that kingdom to be restored again, they had to be talking about the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse number 7. This is Jesus' response to their question. In verse number 7, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So presently, right now, there is no kingdom of heaven on the earth. In Luke chapter 4, look what the Bible says in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Luke 
the, the devil, devil in Luke, Luke chapter 4, if you know your Bible, you know that Luke chapter 4 is the temptation of Christ. Satan has carried him up onto a high mountain, and for 40 days and 40 nights, he's tempting him. And look what he says. Look what, look what the Bible says in Luke chapter 4. Look what the devil said in verse number 6. Luke 4, verse number 6. And the devil said unto him, all this power. Let me read from verse number 1 so we get all this. The Bible says that Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil take him up into a high mountain and shoot him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. You see that? And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever will I give it. Satan has Jesus upon this high mountain. He's tempting him. And he tells Jesus, he look around. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, it is in my power to give you these kingdoms if I, if I wanted to do so or if you would take them, in other words. It's in my power. They belong to me. I can give them to you. And, of course, we know that Jesus is much more spiritual than that, thank the Lord. And, and uh, he, he withstood all of those temptations, and he, he, was never even, he, was, he never even had a thought of doing that. He said, get behind me, Satan, in verse number 8. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. And so I just wanted you to see that Satan has control of this kingdom, these kingdoms. And he said, I can give them to whoever I want to. And he was tempting the Lord with that. Now, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 4, the Bible tells us that Satan is the God of this world. So when Jesus returns, now listen, I'm wrapping this up. When Jesus returns, now this is where this thing can get complicated. When Jesus returns, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven will merge, and both of them, both the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, they will merge into one, and they will both be operational during the millennium. And so don't, don't ever make the mistake of thinking that these kingdoms are the same because one is spiritual and one is earthly. Amen. One is physical. And so that is the doctrine of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. All right, let's look at Bible doctrine number 51, the King James 1611 Bible. Now, obviously, this is a term that's not found anywhere in the Bible, but the term refers to the English Bible that King James I of England had translated and published in the early 1600s. Now, this, the King James Bible is clearly the monarch, if you will, uh, of all Bibles, of all other Bible versions. This is true for many reasons. But there's one very simple reason that we know that this is true, and that's because every new version compares itself to the King James Bible. And so what a blessing it is. So this Bible is often referred to, it's often called the King James, or King James Bible, the King James Version, the Authorized King James Version, or the Authorized Version, several names in which it is referred to. This is the Bible that God loves. This is the Bible that God blesses. This is the Bible that God uses. And it's also the Bible that Satan hates, that's for sure. Now, the King James Bible was originally translated under King James I of England between the years of 1604 and 1611. The King James Bible is an English translation from the Texas Receptus, or the Received Text, of, of the Reformation. What that means is the King James Version is supported by 95% of all manuscript evidence. Now, you compare that to all other translations of the Bible. All other versions of the Bible are only supported by the remaining 5% of manuscript evidence. Now, most people, most people, including preachers and Bible college professors, have been led to believe that the new translations such as the ASV, the NIV, the RSV, the NSAV are just revisions of the old King James Bible. But nothing could be farther from the truth. I want to show you two things. Come to Psalm 12 and 2 Corinthians 2. Psalm 12 and 2 Corinthians 2. 
These are all very familiar verses, but I'll read them to you again. Psalm 12 and 2 Corinthians 2. First of all, Psalm 12, 1 has been preserved. I'm glad God is in charge of keeping his word. Look what the Bible says in Psalm 12, verse number 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And so there is one word of God in the English language, some word that has been preserved. I'm, I'm sure that I have it in my hand. I have a copy of it in my hand. If you have an authorized King James Bible, I think you do as well. The other is corrupt. Look what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse number 17, the Bible says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. And so we are not of that bunch that has corrupted the word of God. We have the completed word of God in our language. What a blessing. All new translations are based on the Westcott and Hort Greek text, wrongfully referred to as the Greek text by people who enjoy playing make-believe. Westcott and Hort are two English scholars who spent the late 1800s communicating with evil spirits and perverting the Word of God by fooling around with corrupt Roman Catholic manuscripts. All new translations are based on the work of these two men, so all true Bible believers avoid the new versions. The King James Bible is from a whole different text known as the Byzantine or Syrian type text, which comes from the line of manuscripts that run clear back to Antioch, Syria, which happens to be where disciples were first called Christians in Acts chapter 11 and verse number 26. God has honored this text throughout church history, throughout the Protestant Reformation, and since 1611. The Lord has been honoring the King James Bible by saving millions and millions of lost souls by its preaching and teaching. I'm thankful that we have a King James Bible. All right, Bible doctrine number 52 is law, law. Now, the word law or lawful or laws, plural, is in the Bible a lot, 582 times in 514 verses. Now, the law is usually a reference to the Old Testament laws written by Moses, and I've, I've never been able to count them. I'm sure I'd miss them, but they tell me that there are 613 of said laws in the Old Testament written by uh, Moses. So the law. Now the law consists of three basic divisions. This is important. You should know this. Commandments, judgments, and ordinances. Now a commandment, those, are, those reveal God's will to the nation of Israel. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. Now, or verses 20, chapter 20, verse 1 through 26. Judgments, judgments, these governed Israel as a society, Exodus chapter 21. And then there were ordinances. The ordinances governed the religious practices of Israel. Now, come to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And let's look at something in Romans and Galatians. The primary purpose of the law was not to save man. Now, I believe it is very important to use the law to show a man his spiritual condition. I, I think it is very important to use the law to reveal to a man that he is lost. But the law does not save. Um, the law shows a man his sinful condition to show him that he needs a Savior. Let me show you that in the Bible. Look at Romans 3, verse number 20. The Bible says in Romans 3, verse number 20, Therefore... By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And so just that one verse makes it very clear. You're never going to be justified by keeping the law. The law cannot justify you. But what the law can do is show you or give you a knowledge of sin. 
Now, now hold, hold your place in Romans. Romans. We're going to come right back. But flip, flip over to Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Now, you know where I'm going with this. Paul tells us that the law is our schoolmaster. We see that in Galatians chapter 3. Look what the Bible says in verse number 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So we see from Romans chapter 3 that by the law no man can be justified, but it is by the law that we are given a knowledge of sin. In Galatians, we see that the uh, law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, but it couldn't justify us. We had to be justified by, that we might be justified by faith. Now, look at, look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Today, praise the Lord, I don't know why, but you and I are privileged to live in the greatest dispensation of all times. God has allowed you and I to live in the dispensation of the grace of God. My, my, what a blessing. Now, the Bible says this in Romans 10 and verse number 4. Let me, let me just begin reading verse number 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. 4, verse 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Christ is the end of the law of the law for righteousness to everyone that believe it. You cannot keep the law to be saved. You cannot keep the law to be righteous. I am thankful for the law. It shows us sin. It gives us the knowledge of sin. It leads us to Christ. That is a tremendous blessing. But if you could keep all 613 laws, you can't. But if you could... You would still need the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to wash away your sin. No man can be justified apart from the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. Look at this, and we'll move on. Matthew chapter 5. The law is still of great importance. We must preach the law. We must teach the law. We need to use the law in, in trying to win people to Christ. The law is good for you and I that are saved to instruct us in the ways of righteousness. We need the law. Look what Jesus said. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, Don't think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy but to fulfill. You see, Jesus did what you and I were not able to do. He fulfilled the law. We couldn't fulfill the law, but Jesus fulfilled the law on our behalf. And so our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ saves us. He, you know, I could say it like this. He kept the law for me because I couldn't. And I put my faith in what he did for me, and he saves me. What a blessing. Because I can't keep the law. He is my righteousness. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The meanest people in the world are the ones trying to keep the law to save themselves. They're hard to deal with. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Bible doctrine number 53 is the Lord's Supper. Now, the term, the complete term, the Lord's Supper is only found one time in the King James Bible. And we read it almost every time we have the Lord's Supper. We'll read it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Then I'll ask you, ask you to hold your place in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll go to the book of Matthew for just a moment, and we'll come back to 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 20. The Bible says, When therefore ye assemble yourselves together, it is not the Lord's Supper that ye eat. And so that's the only time that the phrase, the Lord's Supper, the term, is used in that together like that in the Bible. Now, come to Matthew chapter 26. The Lord's Supper was instituted by Christ himself 
the night preceding his crucifixion. So the night before he was crucified, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. Look what the Bible says in verse 26 of Matthew chapter 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, here's a little side note. It's not in my notes, but I, I just read it and brought it back to my attention. In verse number 29, Jesus said, But I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this. Look what he says, fruit of the vine. Do you know when the Bible is speaking concerning the Lord's Supper and it never mentions wine, it's always fruit of the vine. There, there's a reason for that. Jesus didn't want us to get sidetracked and thinking it was okay to drink something that was fermented or perverted. Amen. Come to Mark chapter 14. The Bible will explain itself. Just read it. Amen. Mark chapter 14. Look at verse 22. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to them and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank, and they drank of it. They drank all of it, and they all drank it. Let me just start all over. Verse 23, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. That's real simple. I don't know why I had such a hard time with that. Verse 24 says, And he said to them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say to you, I will drink no more, and he says it again, of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now come to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus tells us, what we read in in Second Corinthians chapter eleven, or First Corinthians chapter eleven, Jesus tells us here in Luke chapter twenty-two that we are supposed to observe the Lord's Supper as in remembrance of Him. Look at verse nineteen, Luke twenty-two, verse nineteen. And He took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, "Look what He said: This is My body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of Me." Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll finish this. The Lord's Supper is showing of his death until he returns. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you. And we have this phrase, This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do shew the Lord's death till he come. And so we, we see the reason it's in remembrance of him. We're remembering the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're looking forward to the return of the Savior. So we're looking back to what he's done for us. We're looking forward to his coming for us. What a blessing uh, that is. So that's during the Lord's Supper. Now, just a couple of things quickly. Come to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Sometime or another, you're going to run into folks who say that you should take the Lord's Supper every day. And then you're going to run into a crowd that says, no, you should take the Lord's Supper every week. And I'll show you why they do that. Look what the Bible says in Acts chapter 2. Some insist that the Lord's Supper must be a daily observance. 
Here's why. Here's where they get that. Acts chapter two, verse forty-six. The Bible says, and they continuing daily, daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So there is a crowd up there that is one of these must be daily crowds. Come to Acts chapter four. Acts chapter. I'm sorry. Acts chapter twenty. Others will use for their every Sunday proof of the Lord's Supper. They'll use this text in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, look at verse number 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. However, in our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we get from the words of the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentile, the writer of the epistles that teaches and instructs the New Testament church. And he said in verse number 25, look what the Bible says. We read it just a moment ago. Chapter 11, verse 25 and after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Now look what he said. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And then he said again in verse 126, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do shew the Lord's death until he returns. So the Bible clearly indicates in First Corinthians chapter number 11, that allows us to decide for ourselves how often we partake of the Lord's Supper, as often as you do it. There is no set time. And so here's the warning. Don't fall into the trap of believing that every time you see the phrase breaking bread, like in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 20, that it is an observance of the Lord's Supper. Amen. Very clear. All right, Bible Bible doctor number 54, Mark of the Beast. Come to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. I don't know that we're going to get all these in this afternoon. Revelation chapter 13. Mark of the Beast. The term, the complete term, Mark of the Beast, appears in various forms seven times in the King James Bible. All of the references to the mark of the beast are found in the book of Revelation. Revelation 13, 17, 14, 9, 14, 11, 15, 2, 16, 2, 19, 20, and 20, verse number 4. And so the beast, the mark of the beast. The beast is the name of the world leader, the Antichrist, who will rise up on the scene during the tribulation period. This world leader will cause people to receive a special mark, the Bible tells us, either in their right hand or their foreheads, and that will identify them as being conformed to the image or to the beast or to the system of this world, whatever you want to call it. It would be their willingness to conform to this worldly system. Now, look at Revelation chapter 13. Those who refuse this mark during the tribulation period will be killed. <clears throat> the Bible says this in Revelation 13, 15. Now I want to say this in case you're unaware. If you're saved, you have no need to worry at all, not one minute, about the mark of the beast. You're not going to be here. Amen. If you know the Lord is your Savior, the rapture will take place before the, the tribulation period, before the mark of the beast, before all that stuff, you, you ain't got to worry about that. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're going to be left here, and you're going you're gonna to have to worry about this. And it ain't, and here's, here's the thing. My wife and I were talking about this just the other day. If you, if you won't trust Christ as your Savior right now under the, under the dispensation of grace, when you have your own free will to receive the Lord Jesus Christ or reject Him, no one's forcing you, no one's making you, the Lord's drawing you, the Lord's good to you, the goodness of the Lord lead them into repentance. If you won't trust Him and be saved now, you're not going to trust Him when they're killing your children. Amen. So you don't want to be here. You, you want to be born again and get out of here way before this time ever begins. 
Now, so those who refuse this mark will be killed. And he, verse 13, I mean, chapter 13, verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, come to Revelation chapter 20. That's chapter 13. Look at chapter 20. Verse number 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years." Now, one of the reasons that this crowd in this text in Rome in Revelation chapter 20 was beheaded is because they refused to worship the beast, they refused to receive the mark of the beast, and they refused the image of the beast, and so they were, they were slain, or they were beheaded, but praise the Lord that they are reigning with Christ for a thousand years. What a blessing. Now, the mark of the beast is mentioned in Revelation 13, and it's closely associated with the number of the beast. And there's so much to talk about this. We'll read it. Look at Revelation 13, verse 17. The Bible says that no man might buy or sell, say that he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. So, the number associated with the beast is 666. Look at Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15 and verse number 2. I'll read verse number 1. The Bible says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. Verse number 2 says, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the hearts of God. And so this crowd refused the beast, his number, his name, his image, and they're standing on the sea of glass having hearts of God. What a blessing. Now, no one knows exactly how the mark of the beast will come about. There's much, much modern technology in our day. Uh, and it's so advanced that many believe. And listen, I want you to listen very clear. I'm not saying this is it. I have no idea. And no one else does either. And if they tell you they do, they're lying. There's a lot of probabilities. We know it's going to be a mark. We know it's going to be in the forehead. We know it's going to be in the hand, uh, either the right hand or the forehead. So... Uh, with all this modern technology that we have today, some believe that it will somehow be connected with computers and scanning devices and all that kind of stuff. Something could be a computer chip. Something could be a barcode. Let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says it's a mark. I think by the time we get to this, the world is going to be so depleted of what you and I know right now because of all the devastation. It may not be anything more than just a mark. I don't know what the mark will be, but somehow or another it'll be, you'll be identified by that mark as being a part of that earthly, worldly, devilish system. And maybe if, if, if they do still have all the modern technology, maybe it will be some kind of chip or something of that number, some kind of barcode, some kind of computer chip. I don't, I don't have any idea. That was certainly, we're certainly going to a cashless society. And it certainly would have helped the Antichrist and the beast to be able to keep up with people and prevent them from buying and selling and trading if they had something within them permanently to scan. So I, I don't know. I know this. Jesus is coming, and I ain't leaving. And I'm not going to have to be here to be concerned with that. And I pity the folks who are. Trust Christ today and be saved. Amen. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the opportunity we had this afternoon to look into the Scripture and to share a few things from your Word concerning some simple 
and often misunderstood Bible doctrines this afternoon. Pray you'd help us to hide the word in our heart that we might not sin against thee. And Lord, thank you for that. Please uh, help with the re remaining uh, ministries this week, the street ministry on Thursday and Saturday, and our church service is Sunday. Uh, Lord, please meet with us in a great way, we ask. All that you do, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you so much for coming and being with us in our service this afternoon.